Very warm welcome to this week, 60 minutes of analytical review of the big stories, topical issues and all the controversies around the world. I'm Somna Sambo. In the headlines, Edo State Governor Godwin Obaseki and federal government in war of words over President Bola Tinobu's economic policies and its impact on citizens as Minister of Information hits back. And conflict in New Nigeria People's Party, NMPP, heightens as state chairman call for sack of the National Working Committee and accused the party's national leader, Rabi Musa Konkwansu, of personalizing the party. Stay with us as we bring you details. The governor of Edo State, Godwin Obaseki, stirred some controversy in the week over his comment that President Bola Tinobu's administration has no definite policies on economic issues, especially on the removal of petrol subsidy and unifying of exchange rates. Addressing journalists in Benin, Obaseki said he had warned months back that the federal government appears to lack economic direction to effectively respond to the fuel subsidy removal that has further impoverished the people across the country, inflicting more hardship and sufferings on them. Obaseki described the federal government's palliative program as fraudulent, saying that he was shocked that people who campaigned around the country that fuel subsidy will be removed did not think about what they will do to reduce the hardship on the people. Obaseki's scathing comment has drawn the attention of the federal government with a reply from the Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohamed Idris, that Edo State and the other 35 states as well as the FCT could only have accessed more uh, federation account revenues in the last two months simply because of the bold and courageous economic decisions by President Tinubu. The minister accused Governor Obaseki of politicizing the issue and said rather than del delving into narratives which do not provide the complete picture, Obaseki's focus should be on how to govern a dual state and using available resources to drive impactful projects that genuinely uplift the people rather than dissipating energy on the federal government and hiding his governance failures. The information minister says, constitutionally, Governor Obaseki is a member of the National Economic Council, NEC, where far-reaching decisions were taken on the issues he talked about in his media address by his colleagues, while sitting in council with the vice president, Senator Kashim Shetima, and as such, his comments on the economy and the tenable led administration were totally out of tune with current realities, while warning him to stop politicizing economic issues. Well, to help us understand all these issues uh, in the big fight between the Edo State Governor and uh, the federal government, uh, we have joining us right here uh, a professor who understands all what it has to do with uh, strategic management and human capital development. He's Professor Oke Ikechiku. Thank you so much, Prof, for joining us. Thank you very much. All right, so Prof, uh, talk to us now about this big fight <laughs> within uh, this. Uh, Edo State Governor is actually uh, in the opposition <coughs> PDP, and of course, the APC led federal government uh, uh, that took over since uh, May 29, led by President Bola Tinubu, is saying that look, Edo State Governor is not getting the big picture, he's only speaking from his own perspective. While Governor Baseki is insisting that it looks like there's no deep thinking. Uh, under the Tinubu led federal government when it comes to economic policies. Talk to us about all of that. Well, I don't see a fight. <coughs> what I see is uh, different perspectives on a national problem that everybody is trying to solve. But to move from the fact that people are suffering to the view that there's no deep thinking, I think that's stretching it a bit. One will agree with Obaseki that the, about the impact of fuel subsidy. For instance, a vehicle you used to fill up with probably 17,000, you find you have to now do 42,000. You find a worker whose salary has not increased, but he's spending more on transport. But if you focus only on that and forget that there was a unanimous cry for removal of subsidy, based on the fact that when you speak of impact, apart from Abuja, Lagos, Port Harcourt, several state capitals and environs, we roll out bill trillions every month, and actually fuel is not subsidized outside where the elite live. So let's make the point that the removal is spot on, justified, roundly argued for by everybody, both opposition and the ruling party, and that the ruling party actually wanted to remove it at some point. 
The announcement at the point of inauguration was what some people found surprising. They say, oh, probably should have waited. So if we put all of that together, we can do a lot of mischievous commentary. And say, oh, people are suffering. Didn't you think of it? So, and the point about uh, the, what the Minister of Information has said, you're a member of the Federal, um, of the um, Economic Council and all of that. So my take, my initial observation here is that the communication from Obasik, he has a strong populist orientation. From the angle of politics, he's bound to make the government look probably insensitive and even wicked. But if you look at the economic realities and variables around us, is Obasik is saying that he shouldn't have been removed? No, that's not what he's saying. Is he saying that the impact is hurting people? Yes, that is correct. Is it too early to conclude that there's no solution, that the government is being... I think it's too early for some of the conclusions he's drawn. And to argue categorically about the absence of deep thinking, um, I would think that he pushed it a little further than he should. I agree with him, they're suffering. All of us are feeling it, whether we voted for Tinubu or not. But to migrate within less than 90 days to the conclusion that the government doesn't know what he's doing, I would want to give it more time. Yeah, but Even let me just quote him very clearly. He said, mm. I'm shocked that people who campaigned around the country saying that they remove subsidies had no clear plans on what to do after uh, subsidy removal. They don't know what to do and how to support those who will be victims of subsidy removal. That's, that's so it. So the palliative plan is what he's saying that, look, yeah, I mean, removal, everybody had thought that it would be removed by any of the parties that will, will win. Uh, but how about the plans to cushion the effect? It looks like there was no specific plan, and that's where he has problems. No, with. that comment is understandable. To say categorically with certainty that there was no plan, I'll be worried about that. Mm -hmm. What perhaps I will raise as an issue is in the matter of palliatives is that <laughs> the concept of how to cushion it should, could have been made wider than what it is. If, for instance, some taxes are removed, if, for instance, you decide that, okay, at the primary level or secondary level, school fees are waived for one year, in which case it will give those uh, parents more expendable income. It will make sense because their salary has not increased. Now, the matter of, I think they finally came to the idea of um, $5 billion per state. Yes, uh, which so uh, many of the states say they've only received $2 billion Out of it. Mm -hmm. then, he probably, he, then he's making a point that, look, we've not got the amount. But even the states that are receiving it, have they dis also designed a plan of distribution? So what, that's why I say it's a matter of perspective. Obasek is justified in saying that Nigerians are smarting. I agree with him. He's also justified in saying that probably the palliative impact should have come almost immediately. I agree with him. My worry is the terminal conclusion that the federal government doesn't know what he's doing. I think that's a little bit of an excessive <laughs> position. Yeah, yes. Okay. Mm. All right. Well, I would just ask you to hold on. Let's go on break. When we come back, we'll now take a look at the federal government's response to All Governor right. Basaki. Stay with us as we go on the short break. Welcome back from the break. You're still watching This Week and I'm Sumner Sambo and we're still taking a look at the spat between the federal government and uh, Governor Godwin Obaseki of Edo State on uh, what he says is uh, the lack of uh, deep thinking on how to cushion the effects of the fuel subsidy removal and saying that it looks like the federal government doesn't have enough plans or the government says Governor Baseki is getting it wrong and politicizing the issues. Well, uh, joining us on the program now is Dr. Uh, Tochuku Okafo, who is um, a senior economic analyst at the Bates University. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. And I still have here with me uh, Professor K. K. Chuku, who is a strategic management uh, expert, and he's been helping us to understand the issues. Now, let's come to you, uh, Tochuku. Uh, let's talk about the federal government saying that Governor Basek is politicizing these issues. That for him to have said that the government lacks specific plans after announcing the fuel subsidy removal, and that's why a lot of people are suffering here and there. Uh, what do you make of that? Okay, so I'm going to toe the line of prof, what Prof said earlier, right? Um, while I don't like delving into political polemics, right, I have to agree with him on the part of um, um, my objective observation of it is bi-directional, right? While I commend him for being the voice of what has been whispers, right, I also kind of condemn or criticize the act or the action in itself because there was a better way to approach it, right? If you're talking about trying to help the populace, you should come from a place of 
um, solution orientation, right? Now, it's one thing to call it out. It's another thing to point fingers without saying a solution. And I think that's where I had a problem with what he said. Because if he had said, oh, I had proposed this policy impact analysis and this policy um, 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 component alternatives, and they neglected me and see where we are now. And at this point, I can't keep quiet anymore. That would make sense. I think it might be justified. But just coming to point the fingers, I don't really support that. But saying it out loud, I think I kind of support him on that part because I think people have been saying it, but it has been hitting deaf ears. So for it to come out, I think it also helps for the awareness. Now, for the government's part of it, I think the problem here is there is a trust deficit that is expanding between the citizenry and the government. Reason being, people know things, but people don't understand what most of these policies are. And I think that's why most policies in the country don't actually get the full optimal result. Example I can give is um, the unemployment um, figures that came out, I think, last week. Yeah. Or better still, better still, JP During Morgan. Week, yeah. yeah. JP Morgan released figures of three billion as opposed to the 33 that the CBN said. Now, mm, people... 38 billion dollars. 38 billion, the CBN, the CBN actually said. Now, the um, director for monetary policy um, um, operations at the CBN came out, and he made a statement that was quite iffy, if you know what it means. He, he, he said that um, the gullible public will always take any information that is gossip from all the private firms because they don't know and it is not in our place to start addressing all cheap gossip now that in itself felt like an insult because you are working for these people so when cheap gossip come out you have to come and enlighten them and probably educate them so that they can know and understand that okay this is what they actually meant not the other way because when jp morgan comes out and you keep quiet it just assumes that that's the truth so nigerians just take it wholeheartedly and start saying these people want to torture us so in terms of policies when it comes to subsidy removal there is no, subsidy is actually good right subsidy when you're subsidizing the producers but if you're ever removing subsidy, you must remove it in fragments. You can't take it all out because now we're back to a pseudo-subsidy. So the best thing is take it out in fragments. In phases. In phases. And you subsidize the producers, not necessarily the consumers. Oh, all right. Do you understand? Now, Prof, uh, let me come to you. For Governor Baseki, who's an, a, a former investment banker and who is a governor to have uttered that statement, and the government hits back saying that, look, Governor Baseki is a member of the National Economic Council representing in a do state and he was on the seat when all those issues were discussed and that if he didn't make his voice well known how come he's coming out to castigate uh, the decisions of both neck which con uh, consists of all the state governors and uh, of course uh, <coughs> the, the, the federal government and this statement looks like uh, a, a governor Baseki is being too political and the minister of information is saying that look this is cheap politics what do you make of that well Obaseki is in the PDP and to that extent part of the opposition. We must also situate his intervention within the context of what we now understand to be opposition politics in Nigeria. Coming from the, <coughs> the years of the PDP, APC was a better opposition when it wasn't in power. For most of the things the federal government was doing, the APC had some kind of counter suggestions to what the PDP was offering. The only thing is that at that point, we thought APC had all the facts. When, for instance, he said Naira will go to $1, we thought they actually knew what they were talking about, <laughs> among other things. Well, it turned out that statement saying that it was made by their support groups, not no, directly by... No, <laughs> the uh, Lai Mohammed, if you recall, <laughs> repeatedly, um, the question of the fuel, they also said there was no subsidy. Now, the opposition, when they now came into power, PDP became the opposition. And PDP's understanding of opposition was press release. Never a single instance of an alternative policy submission. Mm -hmm. And you would see from Tochuku's comment, Obaseki has also keyed into the opposition. The correct statement that we're all suffering. Even when you talk about subsidies, some of us you riot because our names will not appear on the subsidy list. Mm -hmm. Are we not Nigerians? So you now see that Imagine that Obaseki came out and said, well, this thing was released. We've met at the Federal Executive um, uh, Economic Council. These suggestions were tabled by Sumna Sambo Tochuku. I also said this. These are the likely positive fallouts if our suggestion was taken. It was not taken. And the one they are doing doesn't make sense. So I believe that there's no deep thinking. Now he would be correct.
Yeah, and I know you've always been positing that. I remember when we had some previous yeah. conversation yeah. that opposition politics does not provide alternative. No alternative. They only just criticize for the sake of criticism. You know what criticism. you call that in colloquial terms? is worker. <laughs> worker is not an argument. If you say coward worker to somebody, yeah. it's, not, it's an emotional outburst. And it was mistaken for excellent opposition. Some people even praise themselves. We are giving them hell by sitting in a room and writing a press release. Go and do Expo. Found, find out how I will carry out a political opposition. You see, why that of PDP is particularly upsetting for me was that when they lost, they had a retreat where all the big people were there. It was hosted in the Hilton. Yeah, I, I was the first person. Ekwemadu was in sitting mm. there. I was the first person to take on. I said I will come on condition that all these people will be there. Political opposition is an alternative government. That for every economic policy, there's an alternative we are talking about because opposition doesn't mean your business is to demolish the government the people will suffer mm -hmm. your business is to ensure good governance and so if you're consistently coming out with better ideas while the government is sitting people are saying we need these guys to return yeah, i guess that's why it's called a loyal opposition to her majesty in the united kingdom not in nigeria <laughs> <laughs> and so to some to some the point then um, what do you call it? So that's it. I wouldn't use the word cheap, but it's probably inappropriate criticism. He could have improved his own stature by the quality of his intervention. I believe he missed that opportunity. Okay. And uh, there's something uh, that uh, Dr. Tochuku said here, that some of the things uttered by Governor Obaseki, actually things that we whisper behind closed doors We're how to, do you share it. do you share such a no i don't opposition. agree with <laughs> who says he's whispering it he's been the in the newspapers people editorials are have been written columns have been written talk shows people have complained but the issue of you know thinking that looks like uh, president tunubu just mounted the rostrum received a divine uh, <laughs> i made a declaration yeah, and just made a declaration <laughs> without a specific uh, you know plan which is what obasek is saying but the government is saying that look this is cheap politics all leaders are supposed to be united behind president tunubu he's the one in power right now and see how the states can collaborate to reduce the challenges of governance before the new policies have effects, but he's saying, where are even the policies? No, look at it this way. The opposition does not exist to make the ruling government happy. Mm. You're thinking of the common good, understandable. The government is thinking of the common good. There are most people in the opposition who will never see anything good in a ruling government. That's a fact of life. But the point to make, which I believe we seem to agree on, is that the suffering Nigerians are feeling is real. The need to do about something about it urgently has become a desperate need. On top of all of that, we need a holistic picture of the nature of the intervention. It's quite possible it's been fully conceived, but it's not in the public domain. Now, that's the lesson that can be taken from Obaseki's uh, comment, that probably a lot more needs to, and I will go back to a point I keep making. When a government thinks that it's only the Minister of Information, that will inform Nigerians. They are, get, they are making the minister's life impossible. I was there say to Minister of Information, we went to reactivate all the federal information centers. If, I'm, if my party is in government, every state government becomes part of my communication tool. Mm -hmm. Local government chairmen get called together and briefed so they talk to their people. That's the drill down. Well, Till uh, tomorrow, prof, I keep I asking. I don't know you to have a party except if you've joined one now. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, let me just come to Dr. Tochuku. Let's talk about some of the things that the federal government are rolled out. Because I also found it, you know, uh, worrying for Governor Baseki to say that there are no plans on ground. When we saw President Tunubu in a national broadcast rolling out some of the intervention areas, some issues that they will have to do with labor to stop the strike that was proposed over the same first subsidy removal. And then, of course, these uh, plans that he had outlined to send five billion era, uh, which the state said they have received just two billion era now. Mm -hmm. uh, could it be that uh, uh, Governor Baseki was just being smart by half? No, no, not necessarily, right? If, if you look at it holistically, um, let's start with the five billion palliative. What he was saying there is, I think he just put it in the wrong way. Palliatives are like painkillers. They don't actually cure the tumor in itself. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, 
what is the tumor? The tumor right now, if we look at it economically and holistically, is actually inflation. If you look at it across all facets, it's actually yeah, inflation. Yeah, and he mentioned that with inflation that is between is what 20 is, to 25 percent. It's eating through everything. Because last week, I think the NMPCL put out, I think, 3 billion to buffer the FX market. Yeah, 3 As billion yesterday dollars. Yesterday, we were 9, 9.15 again. Do you understand? It's, it's just a pink hill. It's not going to actually do the full work that is supposed to be done. So he is saying that, and again, it's presentation. Presentation matters a lot, the way he presents things. He's saying that these things we're doing, it's just like we are uh, uh, um, extending the inevitable, right? And the problem is because we are not handling it from the fundamentals. The fundamentals now are first, you need to get the public aware of some of the things that you want to do. Sometimes some of the policies they actually bring are actually good policies, but because of that trust deficit, people don't want to listen again. People don't even trust any policy that is coming out because they just feel they are trying to hurt us. Take for instance the false subsidy removal. It was a good policy, good intentions, bad execution, right? The same thing with the narrow redesign, good intention, bad execution. The same thing with even and right now if you notice the monetary um, the, I think the last meeting uh, the World Bank had um, NDU, they said the only problem now is because the monetary authorities that once carrying the whole load. The fiscal have to come in. Now the fiscal are coming in with the one of um, um, doing a new methodology for unemployment in order to determine who to start looking at, who to be taxed, instead of just increasing tax across offices. People don't understand it. They're just saying the NBS lied to us and they just put 4%. How is that even possible? Now the reason is people don't understand that there is underemployment. There's unemployment and there's employment. Under unemploy underemployment we have both the invisible and the visible. The visible ones are the ones we see, all the artisans and whatnot. The invisible ones are the ones that are with big cash, those people that are not taxed. So the fiscal authorities are trying to bring out these people, even though those figures don't feel right to me. I mean, 4% is quite low. I think between 8 to 15 will make sense or 8 to 14.5. But the fiscal authorities want to bring out these people and be able to tax them such that the revenues will be supporting what the monetary authorities are doing because inflows are actually reducing regardless we have to accept it all revenues are reducing and again the same thing he was saying was this thing we are talking about oil is not about the quantity of volume now we should be looking at yeah. it's about location where and who should be subsidized if we subsidize the producers in-house we cannot be selling to producers in-house the same rate we sell to externals if we can subsidize it at the near in the near term at least for six seven months we can see that's where the policy impact analysis we see what the impact is going to be then we can now proceed but just coming right. and removing it looks like there's a malicious intent towards the citizen all right so well i just want to quote what the minister of information said Mohammed idris he said as president tunubu has admonished the time for politics and politicking is over rather than delving into a narrative which do uh, into narratives which do not provide a complete picture the focus should be on how the Adose government will be using available resources to drive impactful projects that genuinely uplift the people of Edo State. Uh, looks like the minister was trying to hit back and say, look, concentrate on your oh, yeah, state yeah. because people are also saying that you have under-delivered. Don't you think that was cheap politics too from the part of the government? Well, yeah, <laughs> well, both, I think, trying to hit each other below mm. the belt. But there's a further point I want to develop from Tochuku's uh, mm. comment. We're speaking of inflation as the thing behind the whole thing. It's actually decline in national productivity. Inflation, there's a direct 100% one-on-one -on -one relationship between availability and cost. Bandits are not allowing people to harvest. In many places, they, allow, they didn't allow them to farm. So naturally, there's less food to purchase. So natural product, national productivity is declining, partly because of that, partly also because several uh, organizations had to shut down. Not now, in the last eight years before these guys came on. Then the other element nobody, seems to me that nobody ever pays attention to, is the direct relationship between the value of the Naira and the swearing in of a new government. There's a run on the dollar. Okay, I've just come into Abuja as a member of House of Reps. I get X hundred of billions, millions. I buy a house. The dollar has become two things, a dependable store of value Right? And another element you can put out in, you can store value with it. If I buy it and keep, if it yeah. rises, I will change yeah. and all of that. So right now, I mean, in the last um, four months, there's been a run on the dollar. There's Naira. So if CBN likes, let it go and get in more money. This, and we must be fair, CBN is doing everything it can do in a rational environment. We're not in a rational environment. Mm. So you move that dollar in, some people go and pick it up. 
Then the other thing, the NBS, all NBS did was to do a reclassification. Like, okay, if you take wire result, before, if you had five credits in a school result, they say, oh, there was 70% success. And then the re-indexing occurred. Without math and English, you have not made O level. Yeah. So with that, schools that were recording 80% found out they had only 23%. <laughs> so that's what they be. That's, that's the thing. But the other thing that needs to be taken into account, we have unemployment, underemployment, and employment. A factor is overlooked. Unemployability. Yeah, which is the very population high of Nigerians who are unemployable is on the increase, and you can't capture that within, within any of the economic uh, indices that are being used for this calculation. So I thought we should put it in concern. But back to the question of uh, hitting back at us, Obaseki, yeah, there can, there's always something bad that can be said about somebody. So the minister, having pointed out that, look, there's more to this picture than you're given. Then we decide of the man, which you say like hit him back. You two go do your work. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, gentlemen, as we try to coast home, let's talk about these palliatives, uh, Tochuku. Uh, a lot of uh, people are really counting on this government to be able to distribute palliatives that could really cushion the effect on the real poor people. I mean, people are getting poorer by the day, and they need some sort of support system to be able to bounce back. Two billion naira has been offered to the state. How do you think that these states can actually make the best of this two billion before the next three billion is eventually released to them to make it five billion like we've had. Because the government says they'll be giving out grants and all of that. And some people say that this money is just not enough because the teeming number of poor people will suffocate a two billion era to any state. And that there was no deep thinking on giving a Lagos state five billion era and giving Bayelsa state five billion era at the same time. So uh, I, let's start with the structure first. I think this still delves into the argument I was saying about uh, the trust deficit between the government and the people. When you're giving out palliatives, um, you must make public the structure in which those palliatives will be distributed, right? The government says they've done that. But making it public is another thing which many people don't know. And you see a lot of people coming out saying, I've not received anything, all those ones. It's just a way to fill their pockets. And this conversation will keep going on and on as long as there is no transparency between the government on how the structure of the disbursement of those two billion, five billion, whatever, is going to be given. Another thing is even the two billion we're talking about. If the federal government was transparent enough to say, hey, this five billion that is coming is not going to come in one installment. It's going to be coming in various installments. At this point, there will be nothing to say from the governor of Edo State. That was first things first. The second thing is now this two billion that has been um, distributed will be given to this group, this category of people, this sector, and it will be distributed via this. Anybody that does not fall within that category should wait something. But you just said you've given the palliatives how. People keep asking this question how. Even during the COVID, the palliatives, people were saying they never saw anything. If you ask 10 people, that you know personally, nobody ever got well, that. Well, later found that they were stored in uh, warehouses. You get my point. You get my point. Mm -hmm. and okay, Prof. I, I just want to come to that point I raised earlier. How could the federal government, if it says it's actually thinking very well, present five billion naira to Edo State and then still give Lagos State five billion and still give Zamfara five billion and still give by Elsa, for example, five billion. When we know the population disparity between the states, Lagos, Kano, and all of that, Abuja, why should they be receiving the same amount when they don't have the same population? That's a point that needs to be raised on its own. And that's a matter perhaps the government should endeavor not to repeat. Because there's a wrong notion of equity mm. that is mistaken for equality. Mm. Equity. Give this person his due. My due, six feet plus with my size and all of that, cannot be the due of Tochuku. Of course. <laughs> In terms of physical space, when we are looking for material to sew clothes. <laughs> so the point I'm making, take it further. It began with the, in, with the military. The assumption that all states are equal. Let me give an example. If the federal government gives 20 billion to all the states to construct roads, the federal government will beat its chest at any time, not just this government, that look, we've done it equitably. Here is the, here is the drawback. To get one kilometer of road in a state like Kano or Enugu, the cost of one kilometer in Bayelsa will be the cost of five kilometers or more. 
because that's dry land. To construct mm. road in Bayelsa, you keep digging up silt. Sometimes 30 meters, if you want a road that will last, yeah. then you drop a field bags of cement, you drop all sorts of, before you get a foundation on which to build a road. So with the mental construct, without attention to the physical and human geography of the country, a works minister can say he is being equitable. Oh, I've given all the state, but it's not because they're not getting the same quantity yeah. of road. So where I think, and I agree with the point completely, whereas it makes sense to give palliatives to all the states, whereas it makes sense, as Tochiko has pointed out, to be detailed. So that if it's not coming, say, okay, they say it will come on Tuesday. We were expecting it on Sunday, but they've now explained. To assume that five billion to all the states is the way it should go. Of course, there'll be politics. Are we not equal? No, you're not. That's the next level. But the important thing is that there has been some effort made, but the effort is not impacting yet. The reasons for that need to be explained. That's the next thing for the federal government to do. That look, this is the way it's structured. This is how we hope to move forward. We sent in this amount. This is what we expect from the states. Also, some of the states could also release their intervention term template. But as it is now, the controversy is perfectly understandable. There's some measure of confusion. There's a lot of hunger and anger, and therefore people are bound to react the way yeah, we have seen them react. Yeah, a lot of hunger and anger, and anger too, <laughs> like you have said, and I'm very sure that's why uh, Governor uh, uh, Obaseki is echoing that. And you know that, I mean, there are lots of obedient people that are on his neck in the state, and uh, it's been very tough for him. So he has to be seen to be playing <laughs> politics that actually okay. works out the real I'm politics angry. if we, we call it that way but now gentlemen as we try to round off this conversation uh if there was no thinking before according to governor Baseki, now that we have a cabinet in place what sort of new policies do you think that we would have to help support mr president's vision to see how these issues are controlled the economy inflation foreign exchange rate and all of that let's start from you as we try to conclude Okay, with regards to um, um, inflation, because I think that's where I feel that's the crux of this problem for me. With regards to inflation, I think um, the federal government, at a point convenient for them, should try to demonetize just for the short run for six months. Structural demonetization, I don't mean the one you just mop up everything and leave everybody hungry. Yeah, Structural the finance minister said that they are doing, you know, uh, withdrawing cash, cash from circulation gradually. and all of that. And then while you're withdrawing, uh, withdrawing cash, you should also put in place um, fintechs. Because the pressure on Zenith Bank was what cost all these big banks, yeah. was what caused the problem we had during that December, January period, because it's like you removed it, and the only option was now the online transactions, but the bandwidth wasn't enough to carry the population. So it is exactly the traffic. I think it's more of make a spread across the fintechs, such that as you're doing it and you're more, because part of it, like Prof rightly said, is the bandits, right? If you notice after the pandemic, one of the things that was occurring the most was kidnapping, and then now it's kidnapping, there were loose leakages from the banks, mm. 100 million, mm -hmm. 200 million, 500, all those things are money. And they are not being banked again, they are kept at home. So by the time you've pulled out all those money and there is no return, you notice that before you know it, the percentage in the vaults versus the percentage outside is low. So we already know that the percentages outside are lower. So I think just a, a structural demonetization in the short run or maybe medium term could just work with all adequate right, planning. Prof, uh, just very quickly before we go with the new cabinet in place, how do you ensure, how do we ensure that they support Mr. President in his policies, which Obaseki is saying that, look, he doesn't believe that there are plans out there in the first instance. The president should call for the roadmap each minister hopes to work with. That's why he appointed them. Exactly. That's number one. Number two, he should instruct the ministers not to have national summits. Otherwise, we're going to have national summit on education, on the economy, let them study the records, the reports of all the previous summits. Let them see the extent of achievement of those they are taking over from and then produce a template going forward. Otherwise, we're going to have each of them spend at least 50, 60, 70 million yeah. on national summit to find out the problem with Nigeria. We know all the problems. <laughs> it's only the solutions that are lacking. Well, we must thank you so much, Professor K. Kechuku. He's a strategic uh, management consultant who has worked with the government and understands some of the issues. And of course, you're always there to provide strategy as a Nigerian to help the government. We must thank you so much for sharing your ideas here. And of course, we have uh, Dr. Okafo Tochuku, who is also uh, a senior economic analyst with Bayes University where he lectures. We must thank you so much for being with us.